Welcome to University Church of Christ services. The elders would like to thank all of our church members for their patience during this difficult time. Uh, these are things that we've never seen before. I want to do something a little different this morning than we normally do. At this time, I would like for everybody in their homes to pause, stand. Those of you that can stand, I would like for you to stand. I'd like for you to get your phones or cameras or, and, and either video or take a picture. And we're going to honor somebody this morning. The elders want to honor Justin Bond. Justin has been the thing that has held this together. He's the one that has made it possible for us to have these virtual services. And his patience with us and the staff, his professionalism is, is really... Uh, we are to be thankful. Any of y'all watch any other services like Joe and I do, we have one of the most professional, one of the best services on virtual TV. And so at this time, I want everybody to give Justin a virtual hug. Thank you, Justin. And I want to thank your sweet family for letting you do this for us. Also at this time, we want to Welcome Steve and Emmy Hunt. Uh, they have uh, desired to place membership with us. Uh, we won't ask y'all to stand at home, but at the, <laughs> at, the, at the proper time when we're meeting, we will officially welcome you. But everybody send them a card or give them a text message and, and thank them for joining us here. And I know the little sweet grandchildren are happy that they've joined us here. The other thing the elders would like to do is the elders would like to thank our congregation and our church for your continued giving. Our giving has been unsurpassed by a lot of other congregations. If you watch the news or if like I do, I talk to a lot of the congregations around Montgomery, most congregations' contributions are down. Our contributions are up. And this just shows what I've always said for many, many years here, that we have such a loving and giving congregation. Monday night, the elders met, had a, uh, actually a live meeting, and thankful to Brother Leon Willis, he set 12 tables up in a circle in the fellowship hall, and uh, we were able to have probably about a three-hour meeting, and I want to thank Leon for doing that. The only problem is half of us couldn't see each other, and the other half couldn't hear each other. But other than that, we did have a good meeting. But we, in this meeting, we, uh, we had a prayer list, and we prayed for 33 or 34 either individual or family units at the University Church. We have a lot of family units, a lot of hurt going on here at University Church, and I'm not going to try to name all the names that was on this list. But I just want to let you know that the elders are remembering and praying, but I do want to mention a couple. Uh, we want to remember Amanda Redmond and the loss of her father. That funeral was last Saturday and um, we want to remember her and her family. And also, we want to remember Dot and Jolene Vaughn and the loss of, of uh, Gene Jones. His funeral is, is today, and that was a very touching situation. Uh, we have people in nursing homes and uh, assisted living and hospitals, and nobody can go visit them. Their own families can't visit them. But they were able to, Dot was able to see him one more time, and we're just thankful for that. Others I'd like to mention is uh, Larry Huffman, and that's the father of Jody Vickery. Uh, they are really struggling with his situation, and there again, they can't visit him 
and it's hard to keep up, but he had some medication problem, and just remember them, and remember uh, Scott Latham's mom, and uh, also we want to congratulate David and Denise Phillips and being the new grandparents of Nolan Bradley Phillips, and I think if I'm correct, he weighed 1.5 ounce or something like that. I talked to Denise, and she said uh, they took uh, his ventilator off and that he is gaining a little weight, and it looks like the little guy's doing good, so we want to keep that family in our prayers. At this time, let's go to prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. Father, Father, we know that we're in times that we never thought would happen, never thought we, we would experience, times that we can't worship together, come together as one and, and sing songs and and fellowship with one another and hug and shake hands but father we are we're trying to do all we can do to 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 worship as thou uh, would have us to worship we ask thee to give the elders wisdom give our congregation patience because we as other people at this point, we, we just really want to be cautious and we don't want to put any of our membership at risk. Father, we, we have many of our number that, are, that need our prayers. And those that I mentioned in my announcement, we would like for you to be with them, those that have lost loved ones, uh, those that are, are having medical problems, and also uh, be with the little Phillips baby and uh, be with him and, and may he uh, grow and progress and maybe uh, uh, be home with the new mom and dad. Father, we ask thee to be with uh, Randy as he speaks to us today. Uh, be with the things that he has to say. May we all listen attentively at, at our homes and, and may we uh, worship and, and concentrate on everything, our Lord's Supper, our prayers, and Father, we ask thee just to continue, to continue to uh, be with uh, uh, our country. And may this thing uh, uh, go away in a manner that we can get to back, back to some kind of normal uh, meeting and normal uh, activities in our day's life. Father, forgive us of our sins and help us on through uh, this service and on through our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name and amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine.
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this day of worship, thankful that this is, in fact, the Lord's day. And Father, we realize that in a very real way, every day is the Lord's day. But this day has been set aside in Scripture and by your decree as a very special day for your people. And we're grateful, Father, that even though we cannot be together physically, that we can still assemble in spirit and that we have this opportunity to be able to come together in this capacity and to be able to worship you. Father, we know that where two or three are gathered together, you're in the midst of, and we, we claim that today, and we're grateful for it. Father, we pray that you will continue to be with those that Phil has mentioned in our announcements as needing your special blessing. We pray for those who are ill, for those who are recovering from various illnesses, from those who are anticipating medical procedures, but especially, Father, those who heart, whose hearts are heavy because of the loss of dear loved ones. Father, we pray that you will strengthen their hearts and give them strength and peace. Father, we are here to worship, and we know that that means that we are here to honor you and to give glory to you. We pray that we'll be successful in that endeavor today, that we can truly honor you in every way, and that we will leave this place, our individual places of worship, with a greater understanding and a deeper appreciation of the impressions of your word and your will in our lives. Father, we know that you are a God of love, a God of mercy, and a God of grace and compassion. We're so grateful for that. We thank you for every blessing in life. And Father, as, as we as a church, as a nation, and as a world continue to go through this crisis, we pray that we will be strengthened and that we will each day awaken with the awareness and the commitment that we're going to look for the blessings in life and not look for all the negatives. Father, we're grateful that even in this difficult time, you have blessed us so wonderfully. And we give you thanks in the name of our Lord. Amen. Gone is all my dead of sin.
Father, we are so grateful to you for the greatest gift ever given, the greatest love ever shown, the greatest life ever lived. And we thank you, Father, for the reason, because you love us so much and you desire us to be with you. You desire souls to be with you that while on this earth would choose to love you, would choose to worship and serve and obey you, would choose to sacrifice for you. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to choose, and thank you for knowing that we would choose wrong, that we would sin and remove ourselves from your fellowship, that we would sin and condemn ourselves for all eternity. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for sending Jesus the Christ to this earth to save us. Thank you, Father, that he was willing to humble himself, that he was willing to suffer and to learn obedience by the things that he suffered. Thank you that he was willing to suffer pressure and temptation and mocking from the devil himself. Thank you that he was willing to suffer poverty and homelessness, that he was willing to suffer mentally and emotionally by having his saving message rejected, by being misunderstood both personally and in his ministry, by being abandoned by the people that he loved, by being abandoned by his Holy Father. Thank you, Father, that he was willing to suffer physically, to be beaten and tortured, to suffer hunger, sleeplessness. We thank you that he was willing to endure that crown of thorns and to be nailed to that cross, to suffer one of the most brutal, painful, violent, vicious, cruel deaths ever devised by mankind. And thank you, Father, that he was willing to take the sin of every saved person on himself, that he was willing to suffer spiritually, that he was willing to endure the horrors of sin. Father, we can't imagine what he endured, the beautiful, loving, holy Son of God hanging on that cross as a man. One moment he was love and light. He was purity and innocence. He was one with you. The next moment he was torn from your presence and he became the horror of sin, the lust and the lies, the hatred, the cruelty, and so much more. Thank you, Father, that Christ was willing to suffer all alone, so horribly and so long, and that he was willing to die for us. Father, we thank you for this time to remember what the Christ has done for us, to draw closer to you, and we thank you for this loaf, and that it represents to us the horror that your son endured on that cross as he suffered so horribly for us. Please bless us as we partake of this loaf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Holy Father, we continue our thanks for the suffering Savior. We thank you for the blood that he shed for us while he hung on that cross. We thank you, Father, for the cleansing power, for the strength, and we thank you that it cleanses us continually. We thank you, Father, now for this fruit of the vine that represents to us that blood and our suffering Savior. We again ask that you bless us as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Father, we have been reminded of the magnificence of your sacrifice and your blessing to us through Jesus the Christ. We thank you for our spiritual blessings, and as we turn now, Father, to our earthly blessings, we thank you for University Church, for its generosity, for its love for you, for the commitment of our family here to continue the work of University Church and and your work in this place and around the world. Thank you, Father, for blessing us so richly. Thank you for your promises to continue to bless us as we give and to give in the same way that we give to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. Please bless us as we do this giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that
welcome to this uh, time of Bible study, and we're glad that you're joining us again this week. Here we are again. Uh, there are a lot of people who said that by this time they projected that we would be on the other side of this crisis looking back, but we're not. But then on the other end of the spectrum of, of extremism, there were those who had projected the end of the world by now, and that's not happened either. So somewhere in between there. As I was uh, privileged to be a part of the meeting with the elders this past Monday night, Todd will be making a statement about that in just a little while. Um, uh, we, we expressed appreciation for the fact and, and gratitude for the fact that we have the kind of technology that allows us to be able to, to worship online the way we've been doing for the last few weeks and anticipate doing for a few weeks more. And also people like Justin Bond, who has the expertise to be able to, uh, to, to bring this thing off. So we're grateful for that. Continue to pray for our, our, our elders. It was, I was with them Monday night. I'm just so deeply impressed by the wisdom, discretion, and caution and and their sincere compassion for the people of this congregation that they want to make the right decision and they want that to be timely and uh, protect the, the welfare, the physical welfare, and also to look out for the souls of, of this good church. And so uh, I appreciate them for that and I know that you do as well. Continue to pray for, for their wisdom and their courage. Uh, somebody asked me this past week if I have a COVID-19 series that I could preach and the answer to that is no. But by the same token, uh, on reflecting on that conversation, I, I came to realize, in fact, I just read some information just about two days ago that said that one out of every 43 words in the New Testament has to deal with the subject of human suffering. The word a trial or affliction or, or a heartache is found somewhere in the New Testament, one out of every 43 words. And so I'm saying that to say that the Bible really addresses the kinds of things that we're going through, not specifically, but the hardship, the struggles, and certainly the loss of loved ones that people have experienced in the last few weeks. And so uh, this morning we're going to be talking about a lesson that I've entitled, Tomorrow Can Be Better, and I hope that that is a timely lesson, because these are the kinds of messages I think that we need to hear in a time of difficulty, that tomorrow can be better and to look with faith and hope and optimism toward the future. In fact, I saw a church sign not long ago, uh, somewhere here here in town. I don't even remember where, but after all the social events and weddings and even church services that have been canceled, the sign simply said, hope has not been canceled. And uh, I appreciated that message and it certainly resonated with me. Uh, we still have that hope and we have that faith and that certainty and assurance in a God who loves us and will do only what is right by us. I presented this lesson a few years ago, but again, I hope that it's a message that will resonate with you and that will make a difference in the way we think and our attitudes about our present situation. In a play by Pinero, there is the tragic story told of a fictitious person by the name of Paula. Her past was sordid and, and very sinful, but eventually there came into her life a man who was handsome and wealthy and personable. And in spite of Paul, Paula's checkered past, he, he fell in love with her. And over the course of time, he eventually asked her to marry him, and she agreed. But they talked about how that they would manage the problems that, as they surfaced from her past, because he knew about the way that she had lived and the horrible decisions and choices that she had made, and they faced up to the fact that there would be some inevitable difficulties. But their love for each other was deep. And so with the commitment and the resolution that love will find a way, they decided to marry. Now, to make a long story short, unfortunately, the marriage did not work out, and Paula wound up taking her own life. <laughs> did I mention that this is a tragic play? Very tragic. But just before her death, she spoke the, the theme line of the play. And the line goes like this. Tomorrow is but yesterday entered through another door. Think about that for a moment. And let me ask you the question, is that true? Is tomorrow but yesterday entered through another door? Or are we doomed to repeat a life over and over again? Is it for us kind of like a groundhog's day? We, we wake up and we just repeat the same cycle. Solomon thought that was true. If you've read the book of Ecclesiastes, that was his conclusion that every day is the same. And, and tomorrow is going to be just like yesterday. Is tomorrow but yesterday entered through another door? I guess the real question that I'm asking this morning, spiritually speaking, is can we change? If we can't change, if there isn't some radical transformation that can go on in our lives through the power of the cross, then Paula was right. 
and her assessment of what life really is all about. But you see, a part of the good news of the gospel is people can change. God knows that. He made us. He wired us. He understands that there can be that spiritual and, and mental transformation in our minds and in our souls that will allow us to live lives that are diametrically different from the kind of life that we used to live. That's why the gospel is good news, because we can tell people that they're not doomed to keep repeating the past over and over again. But still people ask the question, do our mistakes, our blunders, and our sins always hang around to haunt us? Is there no escape from our spiritual weaknesses? What sins have been committed? Is there any way to be spiritually rehabilitated? Is that just the way it is? And I don't have to tell you that many people think so. There are a lot of people who are, are doomed to that kind of thinking and therefore that kind of living. There are frustrated housewives. There are battle-weary businessmen. There are disillusioned professional people. And there are even college students who have already lost their sense of purpose and meaning in life and just assume that tomorrow is going to be more of the same. You see, some people have decided that life is set on that inevitable course of doom. Things aren't going to get any better. Tomorrow will only bring more of the miserable same. And, and let me say before you do, what a fatalistic view of life. And let me also say that I'm here to assure you that that is not the teaching of the Bible. God's Word tells us that, that we can change, that life can be different, and it can be immensely better. Jesus, in fact, looked at miserable, sin-soaked people that were living during his time, and he said, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life is what Jesus offers to people then, and, and he still does today. That promise, by the way, is found in John 10, verse 10. So your life can be changed. It can be different than it is right now. The future doesn't have to be like the past. Tomorrow can be better. One day, the Apostle Paul wrote this bit of positive counsel. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Philippians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, as I recall. We're just going to skip down two verses and look at two other observations that Paul made in this same context that I think are equally powerful. Listen to verses 13 and 14, or read it in your own Bible if you happen to have your Bibles open this morning. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are before, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I looked at a few other versions, and one translation renders that passage like this, where Paul says, what, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the up, upward call of, of God in Christ Jesus. I think that the word forgetting is a key word in this passage. It's an, an extremely important point because we live in a time when there's a great lot of, a deal of emphasis that's placed on, on remembering. You know, most of us think that we're pretty adept at forgetting already if we could just get our rememberer to work right. But really, it's the other way around. I read uh, a few months ago about a memory expert that made the rounds in the southeast at one time, especially visiting civic clubs in particular towns, and, and his memory, he said, had been trained. He, he uh, said that people don't have bad memories or good memories. They either have untrained or trained memories. And, and to show that, 75 people in a particular meeting that he had never met before, he asked them their names, first name, last name, and then he stands before that group and goes right down table after table, calling the name of every one of those people, both first and last name, without a single mistake. And, of course, we're impressed by that kind of thing. Books by the ton and magazines by the carload have been sold in recent years to teach people how to do that, how to be able to remember. But the truth of, uh, of the matter is really that most of us remember too much. We remember things that really ought to be forgotten. When people have mistreated us, when they've misjudged us, when they've taken advantage of us, it's tough to forget that. And we say, well, forgive and forget. And we may forgive, but we all recognize how hard it is to forget. And if you're living with a burden of guilt because of some sin in your life, it's even harder to forgive yourself 
and to forget that. That is the reality of the matter. But that's what Paul did in the passage I just read. It's, it's what you and I must do. Forgetting what lies behind, Paul said, by inspiration and straining forward to that which lies before, I press toward the mark. And that's the goal. That's the ideal. That's the challenge that every one of us has before us as, as God's people. And if we could do that, life would take on new meaning. It's a big order, but it is essential to successful living. Now, always remember this, God has the capacity to forget. And I mean that only in a very specific and limited sense. Listen to this, Hebrews 8 and verse 12. By the way, this is not the first time this passage appears in the Bible. This is a quote from the Old Testament. But in Hebrews 8 and verse 12 is where God himself says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. That word remember, again, is key in that passage. Imagine yourself having a conversation with God about, about forgiven sin. That is sin that you have repented of, you have asked for God's forgiveness of that, and, and that has been put behind you. And, and, and anyway, you're still talking to God and bringing up that sin. And you say, God, do you remember that, that terrible thing I did three years ago? And God says, in light of the teaching of Hebrews 8.12, no, I don't, I don't remember that. Well, I made some pretty miserable mistakes just last year. Remember how I messed up? And to God, again, God's response would be, no, I don't remember that. What I've just described is not an overstatement. If your sins have been canceled because of your obedience to His saving plan, if you've been baptized into Christ and had your sins washed away by His blood, Romans 6, 4, then God doesn't remember those sins anymore. Remember when Paul was recounting his conversion experience? He did that twice, by the way, in Scripture. This time in Acts, the 22nd chapter, he has an opportunity to be able to, to gain an audience and to be able to tell them about why he was at one time the foremost persecutor of Christians, and now he is the foremost proclaimer of the gospel. And so he's telling them why he changed sides and why he became a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he recounts how that Ananias came to him and told him what he needed to do in order to be able to have, in order to have all of his past sins washed away to have every one of them forgiven, to have those sins remitted, to be wiped from God's book of memory. And he said, when Ananias came to me and spoke to me, here's what he said. You can read this, by the way, in Acts 22, verse 16. Why tarriest thou? That's the King James Version. One version says, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. That's what baptism does for us. When we've come to God with penitence, we've confessed his name, because of our faith in Him. Now, that may sound too good to be true. You see, there's some things that God in His infinite nature chooses to forget, and, and past forgiven sin is one of those things. And yet we, we consider that, we ponder that, and we think, I don't see how that works. That's too good to be true. But with God, I'll remind you that nothing is too good to be true. Romans 6, 4, I just mentioned, Promises that when a person surrenders his or her life to the Lord in baptism, that they come out of that watery grave, Paul says, walk, and they walk in newness of life. That, that sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, that has a special ring to it. Newness of life. That implies that we're starting all over again. That's certainly in keeping with the account in John chapter 3, the early verses, verses 1 through 5 particularly of where Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and talked about what he needed to do in order to be right with God. And, and that's when Jesus told him that he needed to be born again of the, of the water and the Spirit the, in order to be born again. And that born again has spiritual implications, of course. And so when Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6, newness of life, that ought to catch our attention. Because every one of us of reasonable age and reasonable mind I surely come to the point somewhere in our lives when we, where we say, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be able to start all over again. I'd like to wipe the slate clean and just be able to begin anew. And God allows us the right to do that because of the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, here's how J.B. Phillips translates that, that thought in another passage. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, the Phillips translation reads like this. If, and listen carefully to this, not only with your ears, but with your heart. If a man is in Christ, he becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. 
You may not know it now, but that is really, really good news. We can be forgiven and we can change. Life can be fresh and new and crisp for us once again. Tomorrow can be better than today. Lots of people have found that to be true, but I'm suggesting that it's true only because of that old rugged cross. The Bible says that there was a time when they dragged a poor woman to Jesus. You can read about this in John chapter 8. You remember that she had been caught in the very act of adultery. That was an egregious sin. They were expecting egregious consequences. In fact, demanding that when they brought that woman and threw her at the feet of Jesus. And you know what the Lord said to that woman that day that those men brought her to be reckoned? He said, lady, you, you have really made a mess of your life. You've disregarded one of the most important commandments, and that's really too bad because there isn't anything that you can do to change. All of your tomorrows will be but yesterday's entered through another door. After all, a leopard can't change its spots, you know. Now, if you know Scripture, you know that that's not the way it goes. In fact, that's not even close to what Jesus said. What he did say was, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let me suggest that that is profoundly simple and simply profound. And he gave her a whole new lease on life. He offered for her a fresh start. And God takes us, not from where we ought to be, but from where we are. Whatever station in life, wherever we are, and however we stand before God spiritually at that moment, he takes us from that point and works with us from there. Just as I am without one plea. And then one day, Simon Peter openly denied his loyalty to Jesus, despite the fact that he had affirmed over and over again that he would never do that. And, and, and when Jesus needed his allegiance the most was the time when Peter decided to step up, or rather I should say step back, and, and tell everyone who was listening that he, he did not know this man. He wanted no implication and no, he, he wanted to share no guilt with this man. And, and Jesus had warned Peter over and over again, Simon, with your weakness, you need to be, need to be careful. And Jesus would say things like this. You can actually find these words in Scripture. Simon, Satan wants to sift you as wheat, and I have prayed that your faith not fail. And, and then Simon would, by implication, smile as if to say, Lord, you need to save your prayers for people that really need them. I mean, Simon was that self-confident. Overconfident, I think, would be the word. And throwing caution to the wind, Simon walked right into Satan's trap. And you know that the Bible affirms that he denied knowing Jesus three times. And when that big fisherman realized what he had done, he was brokenhearted. The Bible tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly. But if he thought that the Lord would not speak to him again, not have anything to do with him again, he didn't really know Jesus. Not only did the Lord forgive him, he gave him a bigger place of service, a fresh start, and a new life. And on the day of Pentecost... When it came time for someone to speak on behalf of the other apostles, the first gospel sermon ever to be preached, that was old Peter that stood up and preached that message of salvation and redemption. And don't you know that going through his mind was his own failure, but how that the Lord had forgiven him, had wiped it from his book of memory, and allowed Peter a brand new start in life. Tomorrow can be better. Not just for Simon Peter, not just for the woman in John 8, but for you and for me as well. Everybody, it seemed, hated Matthew, one of the Lord's own apostles, because by, by profession, uh, tax collectors made their fortunes by cheating people, and Matthew was a part of that group, and so his reputation was already horrible. We'd have misgivings probably about letting Matthew into our church, and certainly wouldn't allow him to be permitted in any kind of leadership position. But Jesus had confidence in him. Took him right into the apostleship because he knew his heart and he knew the depth of his character. And look at what that confidence did for Matthew. This profane man became one of history's great spiritual leaders. Somehow when a person is loved and trusted, great things began to happen to that person and then through that person. And that's true 2,000 years later. As much true today as it was then. Carl Erskine is a name that anyone who's a baseball fan probably knows. One of the great Major League Baseball players ever played. Played for the Dodgers when the Dodgers were still headquartered in Brooklyn. 
Well, in a World Series game, I mean, the highest uh, stage that one could play baseball in, in a World Series game with the New York Yankees, Carl began the fifth inning, and he had a comfortable four-run lead. But before the inning was over, the Yankees had scored five runs, put the Dodgers one, one run behind. With two on base, Johnny Mize then stepped to the plate and smashed Erskine's next pitch into the bleachers for a three-run homer. Well, you can imagine what happened. Manager Charlie Dressen got out of the dugout, walked to the mound, and took the ball from Carl. And you know what that typically means. But incredibly, he didn't take, he didn't take Carl out. After talking to him a, a while and, and trying to settle him down, he handed the ball back to Carl and he said, You're my man. Now go do what I know that you can do. And Carl Erskine then did something that seldom has happened in pro ball. He retired the next 19 Yankee batters in a row. And the Dodgers won the game by one run in the 11th inning. A reporter later asked, Carl, what did you do to, to turn that situation around? And without hesitation, Erskine said, I, I didn't turn that situation around. Dressen did. And the reporter said, well, what did he do to turn it around? And Carl said... He believed in me. I've shared this with you before, but it's germane to the subject, and I would like to share it again. It's called Teddy and Miss Thompson. I know of a school teacher named Miss Thompson. Every year when she met her new students, she would say, Boys and girls, I love you all the same. I have no favorites. Of course, she wasn't being completely truthful. Teachers do have favorites. And what's worse, most teachers have students that they just don't like. Well, Teddy Stollard was the boy that Miss Thompson just didn't like, and for a good reason. He just didn't seem interested at all in school. There was a deadpan blank expression on his face, and his eyes had a glassy, unfocused appearance. And when she spoke to Teddy, he always answered in monosyllables. His clothes were musty, his hair was unkempt, he wasn't an attractive boy, and he certainly wasn't likable, either by the other students or by the teacher. Whenever she marked Teddy's paper, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of putting X's next to the wrong answers. And when she put the F's at the top of the papers, she always did it with a flair. She should have known better. She had Teddy's records, and she knew more about him than she wanted to admit. Those records read this way. First grade, Teddy shows promise with his, with his work and attitude, but he has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. His mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy's a good boy, but far too serious. He's a slow learner. And this addendum, his mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well-behaved. His father shows no interest. Well, Christmas came, and the boys and the girls in Miss Thompson's class brought her Christmas presents. They piled their presents on her desk and crowded around to watch her open them. And among the presents, there was one from, from Teddy Stollard. She was surprised that he had brought her a gift. Teddy's gift was wrapped up in brown paper and was held together with scotch tape. And on the paper were written the simple words, For Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other boys and girls began to giggle and smirk over Teddy's gifts, but Miss Thompson had enough sense at least to, to silence them by immediately putting on the bracelet and putting some of the perfume on her wrist. And holding her wrist up for the other children to smell, she says, doesn't that smell lovely? And, and the children taking their cue from their teacher readily agreed with their oohs and ahs. At the end of the day when school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind. He slowly came over to her desk and said softly, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks really pretty on you too, and I'm glad that you like my presence. And when Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her. The next day when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different person. She was no longer just a teacher. She had become an agent of God. And she was now a person committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. And she helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially 
especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of that school year, Teddy had shown dramatic improvement. He caught up with some of the students and was even ahead of some of them. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time, and then one day she received a note that read, Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I'll be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. And then four years later, another note came. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me that I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. And I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were still alive. You're the only family I have now because dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. Miss Thompson went to that wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She deserved to sit there because she had done something for Teddy that he would never forget. Sometimes that's all it takes. It's just to believe in people. And every one of us as God's people ought to thank God on a daily basis for the fact that he loves us and that he's willing to forgive us. I mean, we've seen how Jesus believed in Matthew and Peter and the sinful woman and his faith in them changed the entire direction of their lives. And sometimes that's the catalyst that's necessary because I'm here to tell you he believes in you too. Maybe you're living with a sense of failure. Maybe you're living with a realization that, that you haven't been the kind of person that you ought to be. And it may be that you are dead on accurate with that assessment. Maybe you haven't done anything to make a difference in anyone else's eternal destiny. And when you lie in bed at night in the quietness of, of your room, you experience some guilt because of that. Maybe your influence has suffered from your failure to practice the Christian principles consistently. You haven't always been a Christian wherever you go, and you're very much aware of that reality. Or maybe your home has suffered from neglect. Well, the Lord is ready to straighten all of that out when you are. He can do it, and He will do it if you'll let Him. So you failed. That doesn't make you a failure. You've taken a giant step in, in realizing the need for improvement. So congratulations are in order. The first thing that a person needs to do is to recognize that I have a sin problem and only God can take care of. And that's what Christianity is really all about. Men and women looking at themselves, detesting what they see, and deciding that with God's help, they will change. Is tomorrow but yesterday entered through another door? God says no. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. My final message to you this morning then would be never give up. Make that determination that tomorrow is going to be better. Live how God would have you to live. If you're an erring Christian and need to come home and make a second run at Calvary, we pray and hope that you'll do that. Make your life right with God. If you've never become a child of God, you need to take those initial steps based on your faith to repent of all of your past sins and to allow the blood of Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism to cover your sins and to wash all of those sins away so that you can be fresh and new and have that new start that Paul described a moment ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. I read this not too long ago that when Thomas Carlyle had finished writing the history of the French Revolution... He took his manuscript to a neighbor, John Stuart Mill, and asked Stuart if he would uh, uh, proofread that, that manuscript. A few days later, there came a knock at the door. And, and Mill came to Carlyle's house with some awful news. He said his maid had used the manuscript to start a fire in the fireplace, and it was gone. As you can imagine, Carlyle raged like a madman for several days. For two solid years, he had poured his whole life into that manuscript, and he thought that he would never again be able to give himself to the discipline of writing. But then one day, Carlisle was looking out of his window, a second-story window, across the rooftops that were near his home. And across the way, he noticed, he noticed a stonemason, slowly and patiently working and putting one stone upon another, until finally a wall took place and, and began to take shape. And for the first time, Carlisle accepted his frustration, and he began to rewrite his book. Painfully and laboriously, page by page, he wrote it. And when it was finished, it was said to be his finest work. Someone has asked this silly question, how do you eat an elephant? The answer is, 
one slice at a time. Or better stated, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. That's true in our lives physically. It's true in our lives, especially in a spiritual way. Maybe it would be good for us to think about that stonemason and to start rebuilding our lives, one stone upon another, one at a time. Some disappointments, some tragedies have struck. Your marriage may be on the rocks. Your occupational dreams maybe have not materialized. It may be that you're deep in debt and you can't even begin to see the other end of the tunnel. Or it might be something else entirely, but you're going to have to put it all back together again, just one piece at a time, starting from the very beginning. The launching pad of a right relationship with God. Please don't miss that. The only hope that you have for having a better tomorrow is to have a right relationship with the Lord. Don't give up. With Jesus as your helper, tomorrow really can be better. There's a wonderful passage where Paul writes, I has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man has conceived of that which God has planned for him. That, by the way, is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Isn't that a tremendous passage in his implications? I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Nothing that we have ever seen or heard or imagined can measure up to what God has actually planned for you and me. Tomorrow can be better. That's my heartfelt message to you today. It, in fact, can be far better than you could ever imagine. That's what Jesus offers for every one of us, is another chance. So don't become discouraged, whatever your station might be. Maybe you failed. There's no shame in that as long as you're determined to get up and to try again. James Russell Lowell says, not failure, but low aim. That's the true crime. I would tend to agree. You're right on the threshold of great things in your life if you'll just take the right step in the right direction right now. Because God has placed within every one of us the seeds of greatness. But those seeds can grow and germinate only God's way. So if you put your hand in God's hand and follow Him and serve Him faithfully, you can face the future with courage and, and, and optimism because tomorrow really can be better. And that's why the gospel means good news. It's not a message of doom and gloom. It's a message of relief and release. Tomorrow can be better for you, but only you can decide that. And we pray and trust that you will. Thank you for listening to this message today. Todd Brenneman, on behalf of our elders, has a very important announcement to follow. Church family and your friends, your eldership continues to consider prayerfully the aspects of the present COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our ability to gather in the traditional sense for worship services. One individual perhaps said it best when stating that tears are now a part of his weekly worship, referring to how much he misses gathering with fellow church members. We could not agree more. In light of the virus infection trends in our area, as well as information from health professionals and governing officials, we feel it best to continue worshiping remotely for the foreseeable future. As the summer continues, we anticipate more information that will be helpful in determining the most practical and safest date to return together at the church building. The decision to delay further was not an easy decision, as we are anxious, just as many of you, to return. However, out of an abundance of love, concern, and caution, especially when considering our physically vulnerable members, we believe that this is the right decision at this time. In the meantime, work will soon begin through various committees of deacons and members to proactively prepare for that day. The logistics involved are weighty and considerable, so we ask for your prayers as we plan and prepare for a safe environment for all ages at the appropriate time. While we expect our return to be several weeks away, we recognize that even then, some may not feel comfortable returning as soon as others. We respect and understand that individual and family circumstances differ, so we encourage members to return only when comfortable doing so. Because of the technology available, weekly services will continue to be streamed online, 
as well as various class offerings. We are working to make even more opportunities available, and we will share new information soon. We are in continual prayer for each of you. We love and miss each of you, and we are thankful for your faithfulness and encouragement. We encourage you to reach out to any elder with any particular needs that you may have, and we will be grateful for any opportunity to help. We also encourage you to reach out to the vulnerable and hurting within our church family. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. We often think about that in terms of financial giving, but in Acts 20, 35, Paul puts it in the context of helping the weak. We have members who are shut in, grieving the loss of loved ones, and who are struggling with depression and loneliness. Their needs are perhaps greater than ever during this pandemic. While physical distancing is needed, a card, a telephone call, or even a car parade past someone's home can be a great encouragement. As the work of our congregation continues, so do the blessings and new morning mercies the Lord provides each day. May God richly bless each of us as we seek to serve him each day. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are loving, you are kind, you are gracious. Father, we thank you so much that you have revealed these characteristics within your word, that you've revealed them to us that we might know you more. Father, right now, we sometimes lose sight of your grace and your mercy and your love because of all that's going on around us. We pray, Father, for stronger faith. We pray, Father, for uh, the ability to trust you more. We pray, Father, for the opportunities to see places where we can help ease the hurting that is going on. That our hearts and our minds would be on others that we might share their burdens, that we might lift their spirits, and that we might encourage others to become children of you. Father, we pray that you would bless uh, the leadership, the elders, as we make decisions related to this congregation. We pray, Father, for wisdom. We pray, Father, for courage. We pray, Father, as well, for this congregation that we might grow in faith, that we might grow in fellowship, that above all, Father, that we would grow closer to you. Father, we ask that we might see those blessings and those new morning mercies that you provide us, that we might see the opportunities you present to us, and that through this situation, through all situations, we lift up the name of your Son, that we glorify you, and that those around us might see our good works and give you the glory. Above all, Father, we're thankful for your Son. Help us to look forward to his return, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen.